Hello everybody, my name is Kara, and today I'm here with my May wrap-up. The first book I finished in May was The Opal Deception by Owen Colfer. This is the fourth Artemis Fowl book, and because of the timing, our live show was actually at the beginning of May, which is why I didn't finish this book until May. I will link that live show down below. I ended up enjoying this one more than I remembered. Like, I don't tend to think of this as one of my favorite books in the series, but I think overall it was really well executed. We have really high stakes in this book. This one gets, I think, darker than the rest of the series has up to this point. Taylor pointed out that it's similar to Goblet of Fire and that it's kind of a turning point in the series, and I felt that the character development was really fantastic. Fantastic. And it's really interesting in this book because there's sort of character regression and progression, but I don't think it's done in a way that's frustrating. It felt very believable and really interesting, and I gave it 4.5 stars. Next, I finished The Prince and the Dressmaker by Jen Wong. This is a graphic novel about Prince Sebastian, who likes to dress up in dresses at night and go out as Lady Cristalia, and he hires Francis, the other main character, as his seamstress. Francis is really wanting to expand her business, and she actually wants to become, I think she wants to own her own dressmaker shop. Because of the fact that nobody can know that Sebastian goes out at night as Lady Cristalia, she can't really get her name out there, like she's not allowed to take ownership of her work, and that starts causing some friction between Sebastian and Francis. I really enjoyed this graphic novel. It was really cute and really sweet, but with with some really important themes as well about self-acceptance. The only reason I gave it 4.5 stars instead of 5 is because I would have liked more time spent on the development of Francis and Sebastian's friendship or relationship. Next, I finished Heretics by G.K. Chesterton, and this is a collection of essays, and I talked about the reason for the title in my most recent book haul, but basically he was joking about the fact that he was addressing a lot of these essays to specific people, who are often opponents of his, but also friends, like they got along really well. Um, so he would just like write an essay addressed to a particular person and publish it about like why they're wrong if they stayed friends actually. And this collection covers a huge variety of topics, and here's a list of just a few of them that I could think of. Ethics, pleasure, scientific advancements, modern life, theology, storytelling and art, and what kind of art is most important or valuable, classism, politics. And Chesterton wrote these essays because he, from his perspective, he was living at a time where a lot of thinkers and scholars were kind of saying we don't need ethics anymore, like we don't need to argue about these kinds of moral questions, and he was saying like yes we do. Um, and I enjoyed this overall. I found Chesterton to be surprisingly forward-thinking in some ways, and like there are definitely essays where you can tell he has a certain perspective that he is writing from and that he's coming from, um, you know, about like England being like the best country ever and things like that, but overall I found myself pretty surprised and impressed by how forward-thinking he was. Like he was one of the first opponents of eugenics, like from the beginning, at a time when a lot of other um, prominent thinkers of the time thought it was the best idea ever. He came out immediately against it, and he also talks about things like how Cecil Rhodes was like a trash can of a human being, um, things like that. And Chesterton is definitely a brilliant writer. He's one of those people where even if I don't agree with everything he says, I'm interested in how he says it, like what he says, why he says it. And he has this really interesting writing style where sometimes he'll go off on not tangents exactly, but he'll use sort of examples, but the way he does it, it's like he makes this brilliant point that makes you like reconsider an aspect of life in like a completely different way, and it's like not even the main point he's making, <laughs> which I found really impressive. And overall this collection just left me very thoughtful. Like he leaves you with this feeling of like glorious uncertainty almost about like the world and about questions and the fact that asking questions is part of the point, and I just, I don't know, I really enjoyed that. And as somebody who hates and fears uncertainty <laughs> quite a bit. Um, that's pretty amazing that he left me with that feeling, so I ended up giving Heretics four stars. Next, I finished When the Moon Was Ours by Anna Marie McLemore. This was a buddy read with my wonderful friend Priscilla from Bookie Charm. So we follow two main characters, Miel and Sam, and Miel is a girl who has roses that grow out of her wrists, and Sam is a boy who paints and hangs moons around their town. And Sam is also trans, so that representation is in here as well. And this is just a really lovely story about these two best friends falling in love and how they know each other, and it's also about family and kind of family history. Like, Miel has some really terrible things in her past that she is trying sort of not to remember, and a big part of the book is about her and other characters kind of accepting their past. And then the main conflict of this book comes from this, gr this group of sisters called the Bonner Girls, who, like, they're not quite witches, but people talk about them as if they are, and they decide that they need to get the roses that Miel grows out of her wrists. As with all of Macklemore's books that I've read, I loved the writing and how beautiful and poetic it was, although Priscilla and I did kind of agree that there were a couple places we had to, like, reread because we weren't quite sure what was going on because it was so beautifully done. I also found all the relationships really interesting and really believable, and Sam and Miel, like, you guys know that best friends to lovers is, like, my least favorite, <laughs> one of my least favorite romantic tropes, but I think it was done so believably and so beautifully here. I also thought that the antagonists in this book were really interesting, like, they did, they did things or they threatened things that were horrible, but as Priscilla and I were talking about, like, there's still a part of you that feels for them or that wants to see them 
somewhat happy in a way at the end of this and I think that was impressive as well and as with all of the books I've read by this author the ending was just beautiful and made me super emotional. The only like negative things I could say about this book is that there were a couple of places where it sort of felt like the characters weren't as <sighs> focused on the stakes of the story. It was almost like all the characters like temporarily forgot about this huge threat. And there were also a couple of places, especially between Sam and Miel, there were a couple of places where it felt like they weren't talking to each other just so that the story would be a little bit longer rather than like for a real plot or character reason. So I feel like that wasn't as well executed, but overall I do think this book was fantastic and I gave it four stars. Next I finished A Thousand Beginnings and Endings, edited by Ellen O and Elsie Chapman, and this is an anthology of short stories all based on Asian folklore or fairy tales or stories, and I really enjoyed this. I tend to have a hard time with short story collections, but I think this is one of my favorites. And just kind of a rapid fire review here. Uh, Forbidden Fruit by Roshni Chakshi, I gave four stars. Olivia's Table by Alyssa Wong, I gave five stars. I really loved that one and how it incorporated food. Uh, Steel Skin by Lori Emily, four stars. Still Star Crossed by Sona Chairaporta, four stars. The Counting of Vermilion Beads by Elliot de Bodard, 3.75 stars. I thought the sister relationship in that one was really well done. The Land of the Morning Calm by E.C. Myers, that was five stars. That was another surprising one because I'm not generally a huge fan of um, like virtual reality like video game stories, but I thought the way that incorporated grief was really fantastic. The Smile by Aisha Saeed, five stars. Loved the writing and the exploration of power dynamics, especially in such a short story. Girls Who Twirl and Other Dangers by Preeti Chibber, 4.5 stars. I thought that one was really funny and really enjoyable friendship between the girls. Nothing Into All by Renee Adier, 3.5 stars. Spirit Carrier by Rahul Kanakia, 2.75 stars. That one had a really cool concept, but I feel like it felt like a concept rather than a story. Code of Honor by Melissa De La Cruz, 2 stars. And honestly, for enjoyment, it's closer to 1 star, but I tend to save 1 stars for like actively harmful books. Bullet Butterfly by Elsie Chapman, 3.5 stars. I didn't love the setting, but I felt a surprisingly strong emotional connection to the characters. Daughter of the Sun by Shveta Tharkar, four stars. But the writing and the imagery was beautiful, and the romance was surprisingly well developed, considering, again, it's a short story. The Crimson Cloak by Cindy Pond, five stars. That was another favorite. Love the way that she reinterpreted a story to give the female lead more agency. Eyes Like Candlelight by Julie Kagawa, four stars. And I felt overall this collection felt like a four star book to me, and when I averaged out all my ratings for all the stories, it it evened out to exactly four stars average, which pleased me greatly. Next, I finished A Face Like Glass by Frances Harding. This is a reread for me. This is sort of a reverse Alice in Wonderland retelling, but it's a lot darker. We follow our main character Neverfell, and she lives in this underground world called Caverna, and it's a really strange place. There, It's like a place of great beauty and great danger and murder. <laughs> um, everybody in this world is born without an expression. They have completely blank faces, and they can only learn faces if they are taught them, and that feeds into the class system in this book because uh, the lower classes, the drudges, they're only taught a few faces, and they're all like very compliant ones, and because they don't want to encourage like rebellion by being able, by, by like teaching the lower class how to show that they're angry, and never felt sort of gets tangled up in a lot of the these conspiracies and these like court politics and everything because never felt is the only person in this entire underground city who has a face like glass who has a face that has expressions and that can change expressions constantly like a normal face basically without being taught faces there were times where she was incredibly naive i wish she grew up and her environment and everything i understand why she is so naive and she definitely grows throughout the books like she starts to learn more about the world um and about other characters and everything i ended up really loving her and her journey and her character growth and her strength i think neverfell ends up being a fantastic protagonist i loved this book just as much the second time i think there were some aspects i appreciated even more on this reread like the things this book says about classism and about expression and how important expression is i just really liked the emphasis on emotions and on how feelings are not a weakness i loved the writing as i do with all of francis harding's books and i think the world building of this one is just so fantastic like you really you understand Caverna and why it's so terrifying, but why people love it at the same time. And as I mentioned earlier, this is definitely a very dark book. Um, like the stakes are really high and some of these characters are just so ruthless. And I think this is a great book to recommend if people who people who's like have stayed away from middle grade because they don't think it's going to be like dark or gritty enough for them, I would recommend uh, giving this book a try. I gave a face like glass five stars. Next, I finished American Panda by Gloria Chow, and this is about May, a Taiwanese American girl, and her parents have wanted her to go to medical school and to get a degree and to marry a nice Taiwanese boy. But the problem is that May actually hates medical school. Um, she's terrified of germs. She doesn't like blood. This is a nightmare for her basically. And then on top of that she gets a crush on a boy who is Japanese American and that is also something her parents will not approve of. I thought this book had a pretty good balance of like cuteness and really more serious topics. Um, like especially as the book goes on you find out 
part of the reason why May is so afraid of disappointing her parents. I really liked her relationship with Darren. There were a couple of scenes at a comedy club that I thought were really fun and really interesting. And I think overall this book just did a really fantastic job of showing how May is sort of straddling two very different worlds. Like she's caught between her parents' culture that she loves and that she wants to honor and with kind of the American culture and sort of this idea that she wants to choose what's going to make her happy. There were a couple of things about this book that I didn't like so much. Um, one of them, like there was this reveal that happens that I saw coming and that I also feel like sort of negated some of the messages of this book um, and made things just a little bit convenient, I think. Um, and on top of that, like, I don't know why I went into this book thinking that like, like I knew it was going to be about like May hating medical school and for some reason I had assumed that because that's what this book was about it would be written in such a way that if you also don't like reading about like medical things that you would be okay. That's not the case. Um, there were some scenes that like honestly made me sick to my stomach that I did not enjoy. So if you're like a little squeamish about like cutting open bodies and pulling things out like maybe maybe skip this one. And also PSA um please everyone do not use hand sanitizer as often as May does in this book. Like Oh my god. Like I understand it's supposed to communicate that she's really afraid of germs and she doesn't want to get sick, but it's actually a lot better if you just stick to normal soap and water because soap washes off like the bacteria and everything. Hand sanitizer does kill most of it, but the stuff that it doesn't kill reproduces and builds up a resistance to antibiotics. And this is actually a huge problem in the medical field right now. So it really bothered me that the author like didn't allude to that at all. Considering this is a book so heavily influenced by like medical, the medical profession and everything, so that really bothered me that there was like no reference to that. Next I read my first one star book of the year and that was A Bollywood Affair by Sonali Dev. So this book is about our main characters Mili and Samir and Mili, when she is very young, she's forced into marriage with this young boy. In her village uh, girls are sometimes forced to marry very very young and they don't live together, they're not forced to like consummate it or anything, but she's technically married. She ends up going to school in America and then Samir is actually the brother of the man that she was forced into marriage with and he is like this fancy rich Bollywood movie director. Um, he also lives in India and then he has to basically fly to America to find Millie and to get her to sign divorce papers because his brother, who she is technically married to, is trying to get married to somebody else and it turns out that this marriage wasn't annulled the way it was supposed to be. And of course along the way Samir ends up falling in love with Mili and she falls in love with him. Um, <laughs> I hated every single thing about this book and I think a lot of the things I hated about this book could be summed up by Samir's character. I hated this man so, so much. It was like physically sickening to read from his perspective sometimes. Um, it, he's sort of supposed to be like this reformed bad boy, I guess. Like he's reformed by Millie's love. Um, which is like not my favorite trope anyway. But the thing that I hate about the like reformed rake trope is that so often it's not that it's not that the guy um, has these bad experiences with women and then like he finds the one woman who teaches him that like women are not automatically terrible people. What usually happens is this guy who hates women um, falls in love with one woman and he decides that she is like the only good woman and he continues treating the rest of them like shit. And that's what Samir did and I hated it so much. Like the not like other girls vibes of this book are so strong. Like to read this book you would think that Millie is the only, the only woman in like the entire world who is attractive, who has a brain, who is worth anything. Like the only women worth knowing according to Samir is like Millie who he's currently trying to like sleep with and the like two women in the story that he's actually related to. All of the other ones are idiots and sluts and oh and often ugly um, or they have annoying voices. Like even Millie's best friend who honestly was one of the only highlights of this book. I thought she was actually kind of fun and kind of interesting. Every time her best friend would like open her mouth or do anything like we would just be treated to paragraphs and paragraphs of Samir's disgust and irritation because her voice is too high or like she's talking too much or just I don't know why he hates this girl so much but um he does. Another thing that I hated about him um was like the way that Millie and like the fact that she ate food was sexualized to a ridiculous degree. Like, oh my god. I'm not exaggerating when I say that Samir almost had an orgasm every time Millie ate anything. And I just, I guess this is part of the like not like other girls thing because you know normal women don't eat, right? Just special ones. After Millie had a meal or like ate anything, Samir would be like so unbearably horny and it, <laughs> and it described it in like great detail. It was like he needed to go take a cold shower basically every time Millie ate a bowl of rice. Um, it was ridiculous. Oh, another thing that was really, really fun about Samir, um, he nicknames his dick and like refers to it by name in his narration constantly. 
Uh, like, arguably his penis had, like, more of a supporting role in this book than most of the other characters. I don't know if we were supposed to find this charming or, like, why the author did this, but, um wasn't a fan. Then there was also this like weird thing where like Samir looks white, he's white passing, um, and it seems like there's a couple parts where the book is going to really address that and like the colorism in his community and everything and kind of the implications of that, but that never really happens. So you kind of end the book thinking like that he was only written that way to seem like more attractive, which is messed up uh, in a lot of ways, and it was just I don't know why that was in there because it wasn't addressed. I gave this book one star. And next I finished one of my favorite books of the year so far, and that was Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik. This is a retelling of Rumpelstiltskin that incorporates um, like Jewish culture as well because Mariam, one of our main characters, is Jewish, and she is the daughter of a moneylender, but her father is really bad at it. Mariam is really good at being a moneylender, so she sort of takes over the family business, and she ends up taking on this job in order to provide for her family. Like, her mother is really sick and they need money for medicine and all of this. And then one of the kind of like fairy characters, I guess you could say, but they're called the Staric in this world, um, he gets it into his head that she can turn silver into gold. So he sets her an impossible challenge to basically continue doing this and things sort of take off from there. Um, this is a book I think you really don't want to know too much about the plot going in because the way that it all intersects is one of the most impressive and like enjoyable parts of this book. We do pick up several other point of view characters along the way and one of the things I thought was most impressive about this book was that like I loved all the characters so much and every time we would have a new perspective added I was like oh no like I don't I don't care about this person I want to stay with like our our core group of characters or our, our main character that I love and that we have already seen but within like two pages every single time Naomi Novik won me over with this new p point of view character and I was like all right I'm sold you can stay now <laughs> like I just thought that was so beautifully done I heard a lot of people say that like one of the things they didn't get on with with this book was the fact that there are so many point of view shifts and that they're not marked with like the character's name at the top of every chapter. I didn't have a problem with that at all. I feel like within like two sentences I could always pick up on who was talking because their way of thinking and speaking was so specific and like they would refer to other characters in a way that you knew who was talking. I also loved the writing of this book. Um, and like the setting and like the wintry atmosphere and everything and like the slow build like that I mentioned earlier with the plot and how everything starts fitting together and connecting and building to this conclusion where like all the stories come together it's just so masterful to watch like I said I loved all of the main characters like especially like the main female characters my heart belongs to all of them like I love them all so much they're so strong and capable and smart like they're doing the best they can and making so so many difficult choices because they want to protect the people they care about and I just admire them so much. I read some own voices reviews on the Jewish representation specifically and it seems like some people thought it was really good representation, some people were less satisfied with it, so it seems like opinion is kind of divided as far as that goes and that's not an aspect that I can speak to personally but definitely check those reviews out if you are planning to read this but I really really loved this book. I gave it five stars. I just the wintry fantasy of my dreams. It was just wonderful. Next I finished The Missing of Claire de Lune by Christelle Dabo, translated by Hildegard Searle. This is the second book in the Mere Visitor Quartet, and I received this copy from the publisher in exchange for an honest review, which I already did a video on. I will link that down below, um, but I really really enjoyed this one. I think I enjoyed it even more than book one. Um, I love the plot in this and how there's kind of a mystery plot at the center of this one. I really loved Thorn and Ophelia's character development. I gave it four stars, and again, check out my review if you want more thoughts on this one. Next I finished The City of Brass by S.A. Chapman. Gravorty, and this is a desert fantasy following Nari um, and she is a con artist and she doesn't believe in like magic or gin or anything um, she just kind of fakes it to again cheat people out of their money but one day she summons a gin by accident and that is what sets her off on this um, like journey they have to travel to the city of gin and then there are some questions about Nari's past and like who her family is and how that affects this world of gin and then our other point of view character is Ali one of the gin princes of this world I went into this book assuming I would love it and I ended up like really disappointed in it. Um, I know a lot of friends like love this book and I wish I could have loved it too and it did start out really well for me. Um, like Nari wasn't my favorite protagonist, she's like a, a character type that I have a harder time connecting to than some others, but she was fine and I liked Dara at first, he's the like djinn that she summons, um, and even though like a lot of this book is a journey book, at the beginning of the journey I didn't dislike that, like I wasn't bored because we were seeing them, these two characters interact and we were getting more information about the world, but then things started going 
downhill. Um, like they were just walking through the desert for weeks on end and it was so repetitive. On top of that, I ended up really, really not liking Nari and Dara. Um, they just frustrated me so much. Like Nari is one of those characters where it's like, she's, she's like sassy, but with no personality underneath. Like she just talks back. Like her whole personality is bitching to people. <laughs> and I kept hoping that we would find out like more about her kind of underneath that. But to me, it didn't feel like that really happened. And Dara too, like, there were a couple of scenes with them that I really liked. And that's one of the things that made this book so frustrating is because there were glimmers of things that I absolutely loved. Like there's this one scene with Dara and like smashing a table that is just so extra and so funny. And I was like, this is great. I'm gonna finally like, like him again. And it didn't really happen because like that wasn't sustained. And I like didn't care about the main relationship of this book either. Like it just did nothing for me. And all of this was kind of weird because from what I had heard about this book, I was expecting to really enjoy Dara as a character. And I did not. <laughs> like him and Nari both just like kept making stupid decision after stupid decision for the sake of the plot, basically. And although I really liked some of the world building and mythology of this world, as a whole, it was incredibly confusing. Like I have a pretty good memory for like character names and like books in general, but I could not keep some of these characters or groups straight in my head. Like there were so many of them that were introduced to us at once. And there were multiple times reading this book where we would have something like alluded to or revealed to us, like sometimes in a different character's perspective. And I think we were supposed to be like astonished. Like this was supposed to be like a plot twist. And I felt nothing because I'm like, I can't even remember who these people are. <laughs> like this name, that, you're, that you used for this like reveal means nothing to me. There were a few things I liked about this book and most of them came down to Ali. Um, his point of view chapters like saved this book for me um, because I really liked his character. I liked his development and kind of the moral questions that he was facing about how he could do the most good. And like he feels a sense of loyalty to his family, but when he knows that they're not doing the right thing, like what should he do? Especially when he knows in the long run, this might be a good choice, but in the short run, it'll lead to a lot of other people dying, like things like that. I thought those moral questions were handled really well. Like they were really interesting and Ali himself, I really liked, but that was pretty much it. And I ended up giving it 2.5 stars. Next, I finished The Beholder by Anna Bright. And I won this copy in a giveaway from the author on Twitter. So thank you so, so much. We follow our main character, Sila. And she is the daughter of the current um, leader of this region called Potomac and she is like next in line to inherit this and as part of like her succession she has to make a public proposal and be accepted. So she makes her public proposal and she gets turned down and then um, as like damage control and also to get her out of the way her stepmother and her counselors decide that they're going to send her on this tour across the ocean and she has two weeks at each of these stops to secure a proposal for them, from them and then at the end of her tour she's going to decide who she will accept as her consort. I really really enjoyed this. I have a full spoiler free review for this book as well which I will link. Um, I definitely go more in depth there but I really liked this overall. I loved like the soft focus um, kind of fairy tale world building. I really liked Sila as a character. I liked the way that Anna Bright used romance as a like as a way to make a point to say things about women making choices in their own lives, like agency and everything like that. And I thought that was so clever. So I ended up giving The Beholder four stars. And I have already bought my finished copy because I enjoyed this so much. Next, I finished The Candle and the Flame by Nafiza Assad. And we follow our main character, Fatima. And she lives in a city called Noor. And it's a city that's at like kind of a cultural crossroads, um, both between different groups of humans and also jinn. Um, jinn rule half of the city. One of the most powerful jinn, um, one of the good ones, dies suddenly. And this really affects Fatima and she gets drawn into this whole world of like jinn politics. The diversity in this book is fantastic. It's so effortless and casual. And I love the fact that Noor, um, our main setting, was such a, such a place of like tolerance and respect and acceptance. Like that was just really nice to read about. I really liked some of the female friendships in this book. Um, even though some of them, like some of the female characters took quite a while to grow on me. I eventually ended up really liking them. Like there's this group of three sisters, especially that I just adored so much. They were so funny and cheerful. And there's also the storyline that focuses more on uh, some members of the royal family. I actually really enjoyed that storyline quite a bit more than Fatima's story, but I only ended up giving this book three stars because despite all of those wonderful things, I felt absolutely no emotional attachment to this book or to these characters. Like even the ones I enjoyed, they didn't really, like they didn't really like draw me in and like hold me, you know? And I think a huge reason for that is the writing style for this book. Um, to me, it felt very, very much like telling and not showing where you were basically told how all of the characters were feeling. So like every time there would be a moment that should be like really emotional, 
it was just like related to the reader. Like there was just so much emotional distance with this book. I don't mean to dissuade people from reading this book. These character connections are so subjective that I think it's possible people could read this and really like fall in love with it and connect to the characters in a way that I couldn't. Next I finished I Am Malala, The Girl Who Stood Up for Education and Was Shot by the Taliban by Malala Yousafzai with Christina Lamb. And this is a nonfiction book about Malala's life and the fact that in Pakistan she was one of the foremost voices for women's education and um, her and her father were very much involved in the right of all girls to go to school. For this reason she became targeted by the Taliban and one day they shot her I think three times in the head and she miraculously survived. Um, they were able to get her to a hospital and like save her life and I'm so glad that I finally read this because this book really focuses on her life growing up in the Valley of Swat in Pakistan and um, how she became so involved in the movement for women's education and I just thought this was so brilliant. The way it's written is very like conversational. It's like Molala is like sitting down with you like you're a friend and she's just telling you about her life and I really enjoyed that. Like I like the way that it felt like this was very much her own voice. Um, I don't know how much Christina Lamb contributed to the writing of this book and like how she I don't know, formatted it or edited it or wrote parts of it. I don't know how much of that was done, but from the way this was written and the little I know about Malala, this felt pretty true to her own voice and I really enjoyed that. Um, I also think this book is so important, especially for American readers like I am, um, because it really, it really covers the U.S. involvement in what happened in Pakistan and the other, and other countries in the Middle East and how we really contributed to a lot of these terrible things that happened. I think that was explained in this book in a really clear way that is perhaps not focused on as much in our schools here. And I really don't know what else to say about this one. Um, Malala is an incredible woman. As I said, I am very happy I finally read this book about her because I have admired her for quite a while now. And I just think this is such a such a powerful book to read. Um, I don't think it's just about an important topic, although it is. I think it's also really engagingly written and it provides a lot of important cultural and political context. And I know some people feel uncomfortable reading memoirs, um, and I understand why they do, but this one I loved so much that I could very comfortably give it five stars and not feel, like, not feel strange about it. So that's what I did. And finally, the last book I finished in May was Love from A to Z by S.K. Ali. We follow two main characters, both of whom are Muslim, and one of them is Zainab and one of them is Adam. And Adam is dealing with a recent diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, and so he hasn't told his family yet, and he's really struggling with that. And he is currently living in Qatar with his family, and Zainab gets sent there, uh, to visit her aunt because she gets suspended from school because she stood up to her teacher who is incredibly Islamophobic and Zainab has had enough. And these two cross paths and this book is about them getting to know each other and falling in love, but also about love between family members and friends and about allyship and standing up for what you believe in even when it's difficult. And I just loved everything about this book so much. I loved our characters, Adam and Zainab, and even though they're very, very different people, you see why they work so well together. Like Adam is such a sweetheart and Zainab is so She's so strong and she's the kind of person who looks at the world and says, how can people not want to fix this? Like she has such a fiercely good heart. I just like really admire her so much. She's the kind of character where you read the book and it's like, God, I hope she'd be my friend, you know? Like she's she's so wonderful. I love the fact that this book balanced the really, really cute love story with some really heavy and serious issues too. And there's also a lot about grief here. I like teared up like four times while reading this book. Like there's this one scene with Adam and his mom making french fries that I was just like wrecked when I read that. Like it was just such an emotional experience. In case you can't tell, I loved this book. I gave it five stars. I can't say enough wonderful things about it. I cannot wait for what SKLE writes next. Okay everybody, so that was everything I read in the month of May. Um, if you stuck it out to the end of this video, bless your heart. Thank you so, so much. Let me know if you guys have read any of these books, what you thought of them, or if you're going to pick any of them up. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye.